Good morning. Good morning. All right, why don't we get started, please? Um, we, we're Let's, um, to the to get here. Thanks be to you, O Lord Jesus Christ, because you were once dead. By your blood you redeemed us from sin and everlasting damnation. We desire to serve you all the days of our life. And because you have been raised from the dead, we have that same hope. So preserve us in the midst of many enemies. And by your mighty hand, preserve us for your eternal kingdom. Amen. Amen. All right. So that's the, um, the prayer in Concordia Psalter for Psalm 2 that we are going to be looking at here, uh, here today. So there's a new handout on the table over there. If you would like to go and grab one. Um, Psalm 2. Uh, before we get started, um, a couple of uh, just quick notes. Um, first, to say um, thank you everyone for your prayers, um, for safe travels and everything over to Fort Wayne and back. Um, that's a long ways, right? Yeah. We took a little detour and went through, um, uh, went down through Missouri. And uh, we take Hannibal, Missouri, which is Mark Twain's hometown. Yeah. Right? Um, and I'd forgotten that I'd been there before um, when I was in seminary. But, um, um, yeah, it was kind of neat, especially to show uh, to show Ryan, because he's right at that age. Yeah. You know, or uh, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, or books that he's reading and that kind of stuff, right? Um, so we got to stop there, and then we went over into uh, Springfield, Illinois. Um, thanks in part because Darcy said, you're really close to it, you just should go. So, <laughs> so that's where, um, that's, uh, we got to see Abraham Lincoln's gravesite, uh, which is really pretty cool. Uh, a big monument and gravesite, and there's a museum, big museum, and you can find it right next to it. So we got to go see some of that. Um, as well, so um, almost exactly 2,000 miles to get there, and we went a little bit on the way home, we went a little bit straighter around, so we went about 1,900 miles instead. Um, but on the way home, we got to, um, we stopped off and went to church with Pastor Nicholas Whitman, his family. So, um, and then had lunch with them, and so they wanted me to pass along the poem to everybody. So, and I'll say that again after church here, too. Um, so that was, that was very nice. And he's been there for almost a year now. So it was kind of, it was really nice just to see um, where he is, and, um, and to see how things were going after a year or two ministry. Great, take him a little bit. What was that? Did you critique him a little bit? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. You did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to take notes during the sermon. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's right. so <laughs> Yeah, but I was also, I was also, you know, since very rarely do I get to sit with my family during church, and now that I did, my wife was like, here. <laughs> you get the kids today, because I get them, you know, the other, uh, yeah, we'll start the other side. Yeah. So she got to enjoy the service. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to take notes with these two people. It is. Yeah. Although I gotta, and I gotta say though, um, the Whitney's, there are two kids now. She has uh, Delilah, right, and Henry. And, um, boy, are they, um, they are pastor's kids. So, uh, I'll just kind of leave it at that. So you know, two sets of pastor's kids right next to each other. Yeah. Yeah, it's a rambunctious bunch of kids. So, um, yeah, so, anyway. Um, I don't know what else. Um, yeah, just thank you guys for, for your prayers and support, especially just for the sake of travel. Um, all right. If um, oh, I got a question right before we uh, jump into Psalm two as well about about that. So um, 
you know, all of that was live streamed on the internet. Um, so if anybody would like to see that, that's still up there. So it's on Facebook and it's on um, the seminary's website, I believe, or YouTube page or something. And you can find, I went back and watched the, um, the one from St. Louis, which was also around the same time, so I um, was able to go and watch some of that. Um, so if anybody's interested, those are kind of fun, um, fun ceremonies. Um, to see. No. So he just spilled a cup of coffee. Yeah, I got that, but it was her turn. <laughs> Not the first time. No, no, no. I printed off a few copies of the program yeah. from the ceremony, too, and they're out on the table yeah, right there in case the anyone is interested. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, thank you. Um, all right. So you guys ready to jump into Psalm 2? Okay. So, Psalm 2 here. So, um, a couple of notes um, about um, Psalm 2. So, Psalm 1 and 1 and Psalm 2 kind of serve as an, uh, an introduction to the rest of the book of Psalms. Okay, and we, um, a couple weeks ago, we did Psalm 1, and um, in Psalm 1, these two are not connected, like, by time or, or authorship necessarily, but thematically, they go together really well. So in Psalm 1, it talks about, blessed is the man who, doesn't, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, right, but, um, but he delights in the law of the Lord. And now in Psalm 2, we have... Um, um, psalm 2 is a, can be categorized as a messianic psalm. In other words, it's a prophecy about the Messiah. And the Messiah then being the one that embodies what Psalm 1 is talking about. Right? So um, if we want to know what does it look like for a man to delight in the law and meditate on that day and night, well, we look to Jesus. Right? He's the one that, um, that does this perfectly. So, um, here in Psalm 2 then, again, the um, kind of serving again as an introduction to the rest of the book as well, focuses then a lot on, on the Messiah, God's promise about, um, uh, of that Messiah, and who he will be and why he is sent. So, um, just a couple of uh, quick notes about the psalm itself. Um, there is no uh, superscription in the psalm that identifies the author or the purpose for kind of when and why it was written. But it is quoted, um, verse 1 is quoted in Acts 4.25, and it's attributed to David in the book of Acts. Okay, so, um, so that lends us to think that David, at, at least by the time of Jesus, the consensus is that David is the author of Psalm 2. Of Psalm 2. Of Psalm 2. Okay, so, um, and it very well could be that. There's, there can be an argument to make um, as well that Oftentimes, the whole book of Psalms, you know, there's several authors that write these, but sometimes the whole book is called the Psalms of David. So, um, this could be used in the same way, but I think it's the way it's written seems to, to lend itself to that was the understanding, is that David is actually the author of Psalms. Even though there's not a, a note like there is in some of the others about who wrote it and when. Okay? So, um, but for the most part, we're just going to go with this is a Psalm of David, because that's how the New Testament describes it. Um, but the date, the location, specific historical context is not known. You know, so, why is there an event you know, that's happening? Um, is it when David is still kind of a shepherd, you know, and, um, before he's anointed, after he's anointed, but before he's a king, or after he becomes the king? Um, we just don't know. So, um, 
that's about it just for some of the introductory stuff into it. So um, as I get into this then, um, the, the psalm itself can be divided um, really kind of into four different sections. Okay? And oftentimes our Bibles are helpful with this because you're going to have a, um, this is called a strophe. Um, but there's going to be a bigger gap between certain verses. Okay? And that kind of lets you know verses are grouped together. Okay? So if you look, um, or in my Bible anyway, there's a gap between verses 3 and 4. And it's just a little bit bigger of a gap than what, what's between verses 1 and 2 and 2 and 3. So that's something just to, as we read throughout, just kind of keep it, uh, look for, because that those kinds of things are helpful to help us understand um, how some of these verses are grouped together. Okay? So, um, there's four basics, um, or four kind of movements then throughout this psalm. Uh, verses 1 through 3, then 4 through 6, 7 through 9, 10 through 12. So, four groupings and three verses each. Okay? So, and in the handout, I, I put kind of a, uh, a little title that kind of I was trying to summarize what these verses were about. So, um, so uh, we'll start and just look at the first three verses and uh, what I put down is how the nations oppose the Lord. Okay, so let me read verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds of Heart and cast away their cords from us. Okay? So, uh, what we have here in these first three verses then are kind of um, this conflict that's set up. So you have the nations of the world, right, the kingdoms of the world aligned against the kingdom of God. Right? So, the nations are, um, uh, verse 1, why do the nations rage? So, um, they're not just getting together for peaceful purposes, but they're gathering together um, against against the Lord and against His appointment. So, there's a little note in my Bible as well about the word um, rage. Um, and my note, a uh, little footnote said, or um, the nations noisily assemble. Um, noisily assemble. So that's uh, basically, yeah, uh, I mean, kind of rioting. So what the word, you know, this is just a translation issue, right? Is how does, how, how do you communicate um, this kind of thing? So these nations, they're, they're gathering together but doing that in anger, assembling loudly and in anger against the Lord and against his Lord. Okay. So, it starts off then with that question. So why do they do this? And the people's plot in vain. Okay. So what do you what do you think about that? The people's plot in vain. They can't win. They can't win. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They can't win. So part of the question is like, why why are they even doing this? Because they can get together and make up as loud a noise as they want, but they can't win. Because they're, they're not reacting about spiritual leadership. Right. They're all your ultimate rebellion. So yes. Yes, they are. What are they? Whether they're cognizant of it or not, they're, right. they may not be aware of it. I think so. The more they're doing it together. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. 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 Do you see this kind of stuff? Yeah. It's all the day. Every day. Uh -huh. Okay. <clears throat> so, he goes on, and this, this all goes along together. Right? Is, uh, the kings of the earth, they set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together. 
against the Lord and against his anointing. So, again, they're gathering. Um, they gather together and um, are in league and in um, understanding with one another against the Lord and against his anointing. So notice a couple of, of things, too. Excuse me, where it says uh, against the Lord. Uh, we talked about this last time. But how? what does that word look like? Right there, Lord, in your Bibles. All capital letters, which means what? Yahweh. Yahweh. Right? So this is God's personal name. Okay? And you see Lord in capital letters. That's what that means. Right? Is, um, is Yahweh. So, um, they're gathering against Yahweh and against his anointed. The word there in Hebrew for anointed is the word for Messiah. Okay? Which is, in Greek, the word is Christ. Okay? So, Messiah and Christ, same word, right? One's Hebrew, one's Greek. Anointed is, is the same word. Right? Because how, um, how was a king recognized as a king, um, he was anointed. And there's a crowning that went along with that too. Um, but it wasn't just kings that are anointed either. Right? Um, prophets and priests are also anointed. Okay? And, oh, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And, um, and without getting too sidetracked on the anointing thing, the um, this is also part, in a sense, it's part of the baptism rite as well, that we are being anointed with the Holy Spirit. So, there, very early on, there was a, um, um, and I don't, I don't know many Lutherans that would do this now, although I don't think most would object to it, but um, there, uh, there's an anointing that you could do, an anointing of oil that takes place right after the baptism itself. And basically, it's just, if I would do it, I would just get some oil on my finger or thumb and just draw, you know, draw a cross on the forehead or something. Right? And what that is signifying is the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the sense that God has delivered His Spirit to the person who has been baptized. So it's not that the anointing does it, but it's just a symbol or a ritual symbolizing that this is taking place. And that's um, that's a very, very old tradition that also gets wrapped up in the confirmation. Um, and, um, and that's part of the reason why it's dropped in Lutheran circles is because of uh, confusion about what confirmation becomes for the Roman Catholic Church and the medieval ages and, um, and that kind of stuff. So, Anyway, uh, this one here, in my Bible too, um, it's kind of helpful. Anointed is capitalized. Right. To show, to, so it's not capitalized in Hebrew. There aren't any capital. There's just letters. There's no capitalizing. Um, but it's capitalized in ours to show this isn't just any general person that may be anointed, but this is the Messiah. So, um, yeah. so the, um, the nations are gathering together, the kings of the earth, they're coming together against, against God and against um, his anointed Messiah, Jesus, right? And they're saying something specific too. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So what's that what's that language kind of sound like? Bonds and cords. Slavery. Slavery. Right? So what they're saying is they're seeking independence from God. As if freedom from God, as if being with Him, is like being enslaved. 
So that's that's what they're doing. It's a so it's in that kind of sense, it's it's an act of rebellion, right? Or maybe an act of treason. Right? So they're gathering together to try to break the yeah. slave, you know, from being enslaved to God and His will. And um, as Psalm one talks about, right, His law, right, the whole the counsel of God. So, going back to that, uh, what somebody brought up before, too, right? Do the, um, does the sinful world still do this today? Absolutely. Yes. Right? There still is this kind of rebellion against that. And, and treating, you know, being, being connected to God is like slavery. Right? right? And seeking some sort of uh, independence from God. Which, when you flip to the New Testament, when Jesus talks about slavery and freedom completely flips that idea on its head. So it's Paul, right? And saying the true freedom is found in being with God, not separated from him. But the extent is overwhelming. I mean, if you really don't look at it critically, um, people are rejecting God to the extent that they reject their very own creation. Right. They reject their maleness or femaleness. They reject all the they reject rationality, clear thinking, embrace insanity, and I'm not kidding. And I'm using the word of God as the measurement of sanity and insanity. Yeah. And not, not man's arbitrary decision about that. Right. And those things are like off the charts. Yeah. Now, so this is something that um, uh, Pastor Whitney and I were talking about after church on Sunday. And I didn't realize this, but one of the some of the transgender issues that our culture is so wrapped up in right now, and, and with in regards to uh, which bathrooms and that kind of stuff, some of that started in Kearney, Nebraska, which is 20 minutes away from where he lives. Oh, really? So um, that part of Nebraska has been battled in that. I mean, they're kind of one of the first, um, and it gets brought up to the state courts. Uh, one of the first uh, places, right, of all places in Nebraska, right? And um, so, what, and what he was saying, he said, and this was a big, a big topic in um, some of their last pastor's conferences that they had there, and I think he's right. Um, but, you know, here he is, um, he's in his mid-30s, or early 30s, maybe. I don't remember exactly, but... Um, these issues are what's going to probably define the rest of his time in ministry. Right? That's going to be, um, and, and it goes back to really what Steve was saying, right? There's a, there's, when we reject the creator, right, we, then we lose all sense of identity of who we are as creations. Right? And so that doesn't make, like, that makes no sense. Um, and then people, people go further away, right? Because the foundation of being a creation made by a creator is tossed out the window. So now it's, then it becomes a free for all, right? Who am I? What does it mean to be human? And so much of the world can't answer that with a definite answer, right? And if you throw God out the window, you almost can't answer. I was thinking about an article that um, I couldn't even fully read in LA Times in the 90s, and it's just disgusting. And so I think a lot of what's happening isn't even necessarily about transgender. I think it's what you guys are saying, but it's also about abuse. Um, it's about rejecting everything good that God has set up. And with children, it's regarding God creating them, putting them in the family to protect them. And this article was like trying to promote children's choices for themselves, including sexual choices. Yeah. And so here we are with transgender sexual choices, but it's more than that. The whole pressures are they're just yeah. more than that. Yeah, and it comes again, it comes down to a rejection of 
and it, the and that's creation, the basis of it. right? Yeah. And a rebellion against yeah. God, and that's yeah. just a you know that's just a symptom of um, of that. Yeah. It's a rejection of His authority. Yeah, and, and at every level, right? The authority of government, the authority of the individual to be to serve and worship Him, the authority of the parents to raise their children. All the established authorities and chains that we set up. And even the authority of the physical laws and the spiritual laws. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I always, it always comes to my mind how we were created in the Creator's image. Mm -hmm. And all the things that man creates now, he thinks he did it. He doesn't know it was a gift from God most of the time. You know, in art or whatever it is, it, it's a gift from the Creator to allow us to create. You don't see animals creating anything. They live in the same nests, the same caves. The same, you know, they don't create like we do. Why do they get it? Yeah. So I had an interesting conversation yesterday with some friends of my wife, and then I'm going to get back to this. Um, <laughs> but uh, we went over um, yesterday was graduation from the College of Idaho, and that's where she works. So. She knows some of the students that graduated there, and so we went to a, a kind of a graduation party for for them. And we're over at her parents' house, which um, we realized about halfway through, like, oh, we're closer to the parents' age, much closer to the parents' age. <laughs> <laughs> so like, um, but you know, talking to the parents who who aren't Christians, and they had some, uh, you know, when they were young, had some Christian upbringing, and but are Christians, and um, and. The, the dad kept going back to the artificial intelligence, the AI, the chat, the GPT stuff, and what's going on. And he was really struggling with, with that and what that, how that could, is the, the potential abuse of, some, of that kind of thing, right? And what he was talking about was how, um, and this is the language he used, was how uh, this, this could rob us of some of our humanity especially when it comes to, to the arts, music, right? art, painting, um, architecture, that kind of stuff. Because now you can just type into the computer or even just speak, hey, um, write me a song, right? And um, this was a big controversy, I guess, at one of the music award shows. Is they say, you know, are we going to allow songs that are written by our, by AI. How do you well, that's that's part of the yeah. question, yeah. right? So, but here's this guy who's struggling, and his again, his response is it's going to take his take away from some of our humanity. So I said, okay. So what do you mean by that? And here's a guy who's really struggling with he doesn't know what he's really struggling with. What does it mean to be human, <laughs> right? And and um, and. Again, the struggle, I mean, not that that struggle doesn't exist within Christianity, because it does, you know, those kinds of questions, but um, it provided a great opportunity for, as the conversation went on, for me to say, well, you know, we have an answer for that, <laughs> right? Uh, this is what a human being is, right? And what a human being does, and this is something that can't, you know, you know, computer technology, um, whatever, right? Um, it, it can't take away from that humanity, right? It may change the way we interact with people and the world and stuff, which could be a big deal too, right? But our, what is our humanity? You know, we still talk about the body and the soul and our identity in Christ, right? And like, you know, like someone said, right? Made in the image of God and that sort of thing. And he's going, I mean, he's kind of nodding his head in, in the sense of, oh, yeah, I've heard this stuff before. He's kind of forgotten. <laughs> right? But we have an answer to this, to this kind of stuff. Right? And it's, still, it's going to be a challenge. And it is going to be, you know, a lot of you guys here are, um, you know, um, it's, it's kind of almost out of our realm of understanding, but, you know, kids and grandkids. That's really something they're going to struggle with. And hopefully, by the grace of God, has an easier time with that if we can help equip them with a biblical foundation 
and I think that they'll have an easier time with these kinds of issues than we will, because that's all, that's the culture in which they grow up. So they're just going to happen. Is there another question? Yeah, I hear this term of transhumanism where they try to merge yeah. technology yeah. and things together. Yeah. Yeah, and that kind of stuff. I, in that, to an extent, that's been around a long time. Uh, science fiction stuff's been writing yeah. this for, for decades and decades and decades. Yeah. But even going back, um, um, what's the, what's kind of the, uh, anybody know, what's the kind of the start of modern, kind of a modern version of science fiction? What's the first novel? Is considered kind of a grandfather of all sorts of humanity now? No, way before that. Way before that. Carl Schroeder. Frank Mark Twain, right? Frankenstein. 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 Yeah, that makes sense. And this is an issue in Frankenstein. What does it mean to be human? Right? And the whole point of, you know, Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster, you know, is putting together different body pieces. Um, and trying to bring it back to life. Right? And, and um, if you guys haven't read that book, it's short. It's not very long. Um, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful book. Very deep. Huh? The movies are like this. Right? The second one. Yeah. Young Frankenstein. Yeah. 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 Frankenstein is the doctor. Yeah. The monster is doesn't have any, and that's part of the traumatic part. Is doesn't even isn't even worthy of receiving a name from his father. Are these sequels the kind of thing that earthly struggles that are described as treasonous? Yeah, struggling between yeah. Being faithful to God and the pressure right. of the so, earthly world. Yeah, so this is, um, and that's the, the kind of language, and you, you just kind of get hints of this in the Hebrew, but that, that's the kind of language that this is using. It's not, it's, it's a rebellion, but it's, it's one of treason, because we're talking about kingdoms, right? So the kingdom of, of heaven, and you're having a treasonous rebellion against that saying, I want to be separate. I want to be away from that kingdom of God and from heaven. And yeah, and as Steve said earlier, I mean, this, this goes back to Satan, right? And how the devil rebels against God and is cast out and all that kind of stuff. So this is a new battle, and it's going to go on until Christ comes back. Right? So when you look at the cross, you see a lot of this. The rulers and the king Right. Uh, going against God's Messiah and, and the crucifixion. Right. But then you see the victory and the resurrection. And then with the service today about Pentecost, how we're enlightened by the gift of the Holy Spirit yeah. to enable us to see what's actually transpiring right. in our country and in the world. Right. So without God's gift of the Holy Spirit, we'd be just as Right, right. So, and this is um, actually, I end up quoting uh, in the sermon today, I'll quote from Psalm 2. Uh, the sermon's going to be based on the Tower of Babel. And what are the, what are the nations doing? That this is what they're doing. Right? They're gathering together. They say, let us make a name for ourselves. Lest God disperse us over, over the earth. Right? So, they're, they're doing this um, kind of in a similar way as this act of treasonous rebellion against God. Like, yeah, I, mean, I was about to say, like, the Tower of Babel, right? That's, yeah. that's the prime example where people want to be close to God. That's why they built this dark thing. But then they didn't understand the technology and the physics of it, so it crushed. Yeah. Then you can interpret that as God's wrench, right? But that's ultimately what happens, right? Because we don't understand you know, necessarily what we're doing. Right. Not know the consequences of it. Right. No, right. You want to be like God, not Oh, we'll get to it. Yeah. It's it's a it's a comp it's a very complex. I mean, 
it's a very complex story. And most of the time, it kind of gets, you know, almost regulated to, here's a Sunday school kid's story. Uh, but, it, but there's a whole lot more in that, a lot more. Another thing that fascinates me, and I, you all know I don't understand at all, but in creation that there are millions of people and no one has the same DNA. Is that right? Is that right? I mean, that is, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 Were they anticipating that God would disperse him? I yeah. missed that until so now, and that's exactly what he did. So how did they get the memo? And God did it because God yeah. did what they were unwilling to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's something you know we'll talk about here too. I mean, that's what God says at the very beginning. He creates Adam and be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth. And then after oh, Noah yeah, gets yeah. and and his family get off the ark, he says the same thing: be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth. Yeah. And the Tower of Babel. Yeah, they're saying no, we don't want to do that, uh, right? And so we're going to we're going to gather together. Well, years ago, in, in, in Washington, Dave and I went to a lecture at the University of Washington because it was right after that movie came out. You remember where Hell took over, like the computer oh, was running the show, and uh, you have to be a little older to know that maybe, but. Um, and this guy was excellent speaking on this whole subject, and he said, just remember, any time a computer does something, that that is a machine, and the only thing that works in that machine is what the input creates. So, if evil starts coming out of AI, there is a person or persons, scary, that could be the ones putting that in the basic bottom line so that the evil coming out of there is still human generated. Yeah, sure. Which I don't know how that works, but he was an expert in all that data stuff. So I don't think a computer can think without him. <laughs> well, no, no, it's not it's unconscious. It doesn't have a it doesn't have an internal soul. No, so it's to take if it takes over a human, then actually the human is not staying up with same thing we're talking about here, his connection to God, because that should be, you know, the direction of our life. Okay. Right? Right. Right. Okay. So let's um, let's get back to the soul, right? And see how does God react to this? Okay. So verses four through six. Um, he who sits in the heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Okay? So, um, so uh, he who sits in the heavens, so that's Yahweh, right? That's uh, God. Notice Lord in verse 4, capital L, but lowercase letters. So that's just Lord, right? Master, ruler, something like that, right? So that's not Yahweh's name. But it's still a reference to Yahweh, right? Which is why it's capitalized in our, in our Bible, the elements. So, um, he who sits in heaven's last, the Lord's holding in derision, right? So, um, I mean, God's reaction to this, to this treason, is he just laughs and he mocks them. He's like, really? Like, and again, this is kind of a, a similar tie-in again to the Tower of Babel, right? Because, I mean... He's like, really? Do you, do you really think that what you're doing is right, going to reach up in the heavens? Is going to reach up to you? You don't understand what's going on, uh -uh. and and it's the same here, because this doesn't this poses no threat to God, right? And um, and they don't understand the consequences and what what actually they're doing. And his response is he laughs, he mocks, <coughs> and there's kind of it's amusement at the at their feeble advice to do this, right? And uh, some of the work one of the words that shows the derision word that's in there um, is related to the word for mocking. And it's one that shows a lack of respect and um, and one that has contempt to it. Right? So in verse five then 
This mocking, this laughter and mocking turns to anger and wrath. So it's not just I'm laughing at how silly this is, but the result of this is uh, verse 5. Again. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. Okay? And um, it's, it's almost a little strange. Um, unless we, we understand what's going on here. But verse 6, he says, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Now for God's people, those are words of comfort, not of anger and wrath. But if, if you're rebelling against God and saying, Now I don't want to be un in that kingdom, now you're at odds and an enemy with this king. And that is, um, that is where the terror and the anger and the wrath now come from, is now God and his anointed, the Messiah, the king, is, uh, you're now set against them, opposed. And that should be terrifying. So, uh, again, verse 6, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Okay? So, um, what, what also sits on that? So, Zion, sometimes Mount Zion, right? And what are churches named after? Right? What sits on top of the hill or Mount of Zion? The temple, right? So, Jerusalem, right, is, is all, is right there. And on that specific one, and it really is just a hill, on that one hill, that's where the temple sat, right? And that's where the glory of the Lord, right, came and descended and kind of resides. Know, the Old Testament, particularly, right, residing in the temple, so that people know, you know, where is God, where can I interact with Him, in mercy, particularly, and, and so I don't face that judgment. Because His anger is always righteous, right? According to yes, it is. Yes, His anger is always righteous, which is different than our anger, yeah. which <laughs> is rarely righteous. <laughs> Not to say that he couldn't have it, but um, most of the time, right? Anger is. Um, when I was a girl, we always called the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost. So when did that change? In the 60s. In the it's just updating language. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it means the same. Well, I know, but if you're talking to someone that heard it and they're not a Christian, and they're not understanding, right. then you have yeah. to explain. Yeah, and that's because that's because the meaning of the English word ghost has changed. No. When you think of ghost, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't necessarily. Well, no, you know. <laughs> it's, it's a generational thing. But you tell a 15-year-old kid ghost, and that's what they think of. Yeah. Right? So it's just updating a language. That's all. And it came with, with updating and changing of, uh, away from uh, some of the more archaic language, like in the King James and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, bell choir people, right? Uh, choir people. Um, they're getting up. So. All right, let's keep going. Verses 7 through 9, okay? Uh, verse 7, I will tell of the decree... The Lord said to me, or Yahweh said to me, You are my son, today I begot. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Again, so you get some of the wrath and the anger that comes um, out of that. Um, verse 7, though, is a key verse in this entire psalm. This is kind of what it's all about here. Um, God's announcement of the king, the Messiah, right? You are my son. Today I have begotten. So we have allusions here back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 16, where God promises he's going to establish the throne of David, right? And for a seed forever, okay? Um, uh, 2 Samuel verse 14 is at kind of that heart of that promise um, in and of itself. So you guys, if you're interested, you can go back and look at that um, later. But here we have kind of the king, uh, the king's installation, coronation, that kind of thing. 
where Yahweh creates a relationship using the, this language. Today I've begotten you is uh, in Hebrew. That's also kind of an adoption language. So like I'm recognizing you, I'm bringing you into the family, recognizing you as the king. Okay? So, um, and along with that um, comes uh, uh, the hereditary rights, the authority, the heritage of, of the kingship of God. So, where does this, um, where does this verse um, show up in the New Testament? The Word became flesh. Okay. Well, okay. So, you have the Word became flesh. So, you have, um, um, you have the incarnation. Right, where, where God becomes man. Right. Isn't there a consideration that what is, uh, of what that man David? That's Old Testament. Okay. So where is the New Testament? Yeah. yeah. The baptism of Jesus. Yeah, the baptism of Jesus, and then in the Transfiguration we get similar wording, right? Where where you have the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus, right? Like a dove, he's baptized with a voice from heaven. This is my beloved Son. And the baptism of Jesus kind of is, that's, that's when he starts doing his public ministry, it's right after that, right? He goes out to the wilderness first and comes back and you know, he's preaching and teaching and doing miracles and that kind of stuff, right? So that's kind of his coronation, is that his baptism, okay, um, in that kind of sense. So, um, and then you also have kind of allusions to this as well. And um, in the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, where Jesus says, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. And why? Well, because he's the only God, the Son of God, right? The Messiah, the King, that's been placed on the throne of the cross, take, bears the wrath that our rebellion deserves and is raised from the dead, right? So that all who now believe in him um, have that eternal life and dwell with the kingdom of heaven. So, um, so this is ultimately then kind of fulfilled, right, in the person and the work of Jesus, particularly in his, uh, in these major events, the incarnation, the baptism and transfiguration, the death and the resurrection, and the ascension. So um, it's, it's all kind of tied into this kind of stuff, okay? Um, so... Um, it says kind of an interesting thing too, where again God is speaking, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. Okay, so it's just at the um, at the asking of the Son of God, uh, you know, the world, the world and everything in it is is Jesus for the asking. And um, Jesus talks about this a little bit in his high priestly prayer in John, um, 14, 15, 16, and 17, um, in those sections. He, uh, he talks about this kind of stuff. Um, uh, let's do the last verses here, 10 through 12. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge. Okay. So, uh, we have the warning here. So, these kings are rebelling. And it's a call um, to repent, to be, to think through. You know, this is the consequence if you keep going this way. So turn back to me, right, and come back. Um, so it's a warning to act wisely, which goes back to um, to Psalm one, right? And what does this look like? It's the one that meditates on the, the law of the Lord day and night, right? Who um, loves the counsel of God, who He is, and what He's done. So he sends out this warning, and then um, and also a call to action, right? So there's a, stop doing what you're doing and come back. But also, verse 11, serve the Lord with fear, right? And rejoice with trembling. So recognize, you know, that um, that God that there is a righteous anger and a wrath that comes with rebellion, 
right? And, and serve him with, with that due respect, both of his mercy, but also of his wrath. And then verse 12, kiss the son, right? Um, which is an acknowledgement of dominance and authority, right? Like kiss the ring of the king. Right? It's a recognition that um, the God is, is Messiah, that this is the king, and that you're in submission to him. And so, um, so do this, lest he become angry and he perish. And then lastly, the blessed are all those who are all who take refuge in them. So again, kind of hearkening back to uh, Psalm 1, right? Blessed is the man who doesn't know the ways that his kings are going, right? And the one who belongs to the Lord. So, um, a couple of quick notes here in the last few minutes before we close. But um, again, in the New Testament, now, um, in some of your guys' Bibles, just every Bible is a little bit differently. Um, and electronic Bibles sometimes do this, do this differently as well. But a lot of Bibles will have cross-references cross in there of some shape or form. So I'm using the Lutheran Study Bible, and there's a little column right in the middle. And that's the cross-reference. Right? Which means where there are other Bible verses or passages that talk about similar things. Right? Part of that is where citations show up, they'll note that. Right? So if you have a Bible that does this kind of thing, that's a pretty valuable tool. And so especially um, when reading the New or the Old Testament, you kind of want to keep an eye out. It, it just is a cheat and a help. Where does this show up in the New Testament? As well as in the New Testament, you know, it doesn't always say... So there are places where Psalm 2 is quoted in the New Testament. It doesn't say, I'm quoting from Psalm 2, verse 7, right? And so it's nice to have that kind of cross-reference so you know the exact chapter and verse of where it's being quoted. So just, uh, just a little bit. Um, in the New Testament, so um, the, the New Testament and the early church interpret Psalm 2 specifically in light of Christ and his work. In other words, again, it's a messianic psalm. Okay? And they see Jesus doing things, and they go, Jesus is fulfilling what Psalm 2 is talking about. Okay. So, um, um, verse 1 is cited in Acts 4, 25, 20, and 26, and in um, Acts, or, Verse 7 is cited in Acts 13, 13, and in Hebrews 1, 5, and 5, 5. Okay, so that's where these things show up in the New Testament. And in Acts 4, just for some context, Acts 4, the context is a persecution of believers after preaching the gospel and Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. So Pentecost has happened. Peter and John are preaching about what's happened, you know, all these things that have happened, the death and resurrection. Jesus, they get thrown into jail and said, don't talk about this stuff. And they get out and they say, look, this is what Psalm 2 is talking about. Right? Is that the people's um, plot in vain? And they rage against, against God and his king, Jesus. Right? In Acts 13 and in Hebrews 5, it's used the same way, where in verse 7, where it says, uh, the Lord said to me, you're my son, today I begotten you. They kind of focus on the word today in there. And um, today meaning the day of uh, installation, coronation. Right? So the way, the way that that is, is, well, what day is today? And um, in uh, Acts 13 and Hebrews 5, they're saying it's now. Right? It's happened. Okay? Um, I begotten you again um, becomes a, res a reference to the resurrection um, and uh, kind of what goes on kind of a for from grace from the dead. Okay. Um, and then Paul also alludes to it in Romans chapter 1. Okay. Um, so when we read Psalm 2 then we both read it kind of in realization of, kind of more of the immediate context of, um, of when it was written probably Possibly, probably by the context of that kingdom and the promises that God has given there, right? That even as the um, 
Philistines and Aramites and the Edomites. All these guys are kind of gathering against Jerusalem, and God preserves his people. Okay? And they kind of laughs and mocks at their feeble attempts, but it ultimately finds its fulfillment to Christ. So, and then at that, um, that last day, when Christ return, that's kind of when it's going to all be done, right? And a day that we look forward to, to say, okay, finally, come and wear, um, what's one of the verses, where all your enemies will be your footstool. So, um, just a couple of uh, final notes then. So where does this show up, kind of in the church here? And uh, we don't use all of this stuff either, but this is just kind of in all the resources we have where uh, Psalm 2 shows up. So it shows up on Easter Tuesday, so Tuesday after Easter on Christmas Day, Trinity 17 on the Transfiguration. Um, verse 7 shows up on Christmas Eve, um, yeah, both as a psalm but also as an antiphon for the intro it. Um, Portions of this show up as the intro to Christmas midnight, baptism of our Lord, uh, proper 16, which would be in summer. Um, so in all these things, we see how the church is ordered, you know, where do this, where these verses show up? Well, they show up at the incarnation and at the times of the, the resurrection, and then baptism. So these are the connections that the New Testament made to all of this, so that's why that's that way okay. So, um, that's all. Your psalm two. Okay. So um, we're gonna keep uh, we're gonna keep going uh, here. Uh, the next psalm we're gonna look at again. We could um, we aren't necessarily gonna go in order, but if for whatever reason we skip the psalm. And you're like, I really, really, really want to look at this. Uh, we can come to But the next psalm that I wanted to look at, um, in particular, was Psalm 6. Six. Okay? And Psalm 6 is a penitential psalm. Okay? A penitential psalm. So, um, asking for repentance. Right? So, um, so that's the one we'll go to uh, for next week, and then. Uh, What's the in your quotations when you're talking about baptism, transfiguration? What does the CF mean in front of the baptism of Jesus? Cross reference. Oh. Yeah. So yeah. Sorry. So yeah, just cross reference. So see, you know, consider baptism and transfiguration. Those are the. All right. Well, let's um, close with a word of prayer, and then we can head on into church. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks for um, for placing your Son Jesus, uh, the King, on His throne at His ascension. We remember and celebrate that, and um, continue on in that celebration. Also, that He has sent us Your Spirit, O oh Lord, um, that we might believe and that we might be part of this kingdom of God. So protect us against um, the attacks and the troubles of the sinful world, as well as our own sinfulness. Help us um, to come back to you and live under